Welcome to section 1.3. We're going to be speaking about data collection and experimental design. So what is the goal of a statistical study is the first thing that we would ask ourselves. The goal of a statistical study is to collect data and use the data to make a decision. And the decisions that we make can only be as good as the process that we use to collect the data. So setting up an experimental design or the design of the experiment is quite critical. Again, we do this every day without realizing it in all the decisions we make, from picking the brand of coffee to making a decision as to which gas station to go to. And now what we're going to do is just look at the specific portions of it that we're doing without even really realizing it. Study. This slide can also be found in your text, but these are the guidelines that we use when designing a statistical study. We want to identify the variables of interest, the focus, and the population of the study, meaning what are we looking at and who are we looking to represent the data for. We talked at length about what the variables are um, in the first section and also about the population, so now we're really starting to put use to the terminology we've learned. We're going to develop a detailed plan for collecting data. If we're using a sample, making sure the sample is representative of the population. So that's key. Make sure everybody is represented in the data that we're gathering. We're going to collect our data. Then we're going to describe the data using descriptive statistics techniques. And in section two, we're going to start talking about what the descriptive statistics techniques are that we're going to be using. Next, we're going to interpret the data and make decisions about the population using inferential statistics. So in this step here four, we're gathering the data, and in step five, we're using that data to make an inference for the population. And lastly, we're going to identify any possible errors that could have occurred in our study. So we're taking a look at the two types of statistical studies. We have one over here on the left, and we have number two over here on the right. I'm going to read them each. On the left, to study predator-prey relationships in the Raring Sea, researchers looked at the feeding behaviors of three species, black-legged kittiwakes, thick-billed mirrors, and northern sea fur seals. So they're looking at the feeding behaviors. On the right side, to study the effects of music on driving habits, Eight drivers, four male and four female, drove 500 miles while listening to different genres of music. Okay, so if you look at the two and compare and contrast, on the left side we're looking at behaviors, and on the right side we're having them listen to different genres of music, so we're affecting something. So what the noticeable differences, differences are include on the left side, it's observational. You're just watching. You're not changing anything. You're watching to see their, be their feeding behaviors. And on the right side, it's experimental because you are deliberately applying a treatment before observing the results. The treatment that we're applying is making sure that they have different genres of music. And um, we're studying the effects that it has on them on their driving habits. So as we play different music, we're studying their behaviors versus just taking a look at species. It's important to note that within the experimental, there are different layers as well. You have a treatment group which would receive the treatment. Um, let's think about if I was trying to have people quit smoking. So maybe the treatment group gets a drug to help them quit smoking. And the control group has no treatment that's going to be applied. So no treatment is applied. So whereas the treatment group might be getting the drug to quit smoking, the control group might be getting a placebo, and they're not receiving the drug. Um, so those are the two differences between the types of groups you can have in an experiment. To break it down even, even further, um, you can have studies where it's blind, meaning that if I'm participating in a study, I don't know whether I'm getting the placebo or the actual drug. So that would be a blind treatment in that I don't know what I'm getting. And a double blind is that the researcher doesn't know either. 
because there could be a tendency for the researcher to say something that might sway the person in the treatment group to think that it's working or the control group to think that it's working. And I don't know if anybody watches um, Grey's Anatomy, but there was a big thing with Meredith where she was trying to sway people because she had the treatment or whatever the case may be. So this always reminds me of Grey's Anatomy. Not that I'm addicted to that show. Okay, give this one a shot. In a survey of 177,237 U.S. adults, 65% said they visited a dentist in the last 12 months. Is it observational or experimental? So think about it for a second. It's observational. We didn't ask them to do anything. We didn't affect them in any manner other than to ask them a question. Did you go to the dentist in the last 12 months or didn't you? There's also a different methods of data collection. A simulation is when you use mathematical or physical models to reproduce the conditions of a situation or a process. Um, and with this, I always think about, you know, crash test dummies. If we're simulating a car accident, we wouldn't actually want to do the car accident, so we would actually just do like a crash test with um, those dummy guys. Another thing is when we're studying the effects of population growth, um, we don't actually grow the population. We take a look at what the population would be through mathematical computations in a system or the population decrease based on perhaps um, the elimination of a bacteria or the elimination of a certain vegetation. Um, or how about just anything in war? Um, they simulate their trajectories. I know it's badly written, but um, if they're going to shoot a missile or if they're going to shoot something, um, they use simulations to see if they actually hit their target um, I, I think I've seen that in a ton of war movies lately. A survey is the one that we see more commonly. It's an, an investigation of one or more, my stylist doesn't want to work, one or more characteristics of a population. Um, you're asking people, so you just ask, okay? Uh, I think about people who used to stand at the mall with a clipboard, so, you know, a direct survey um, that you're seeing people. It could be a phone survey, it could be a mail survey. There's so many different methods in which you're um, conducting these surveys, but it's just asking, not simulating. All right, so there's a little bit behind this one. Um, if, you're con if you're designing the right experiment, you have to have control, randomization, and replication. So I'm just going to pause the video and put some notes in and then briefly discuss it. The three things you need to make sure are set up to have a good experimental design our control. That's your grouping. Having your treatment group and your control group. Determining if you're going to have blinding or double blinding. You also want to look out for confounding variables, confounding variables here, um, which means sometimes when you set up a, an experiment, if you've got too much going on, you might not know what's causing the result. So um, you could think about weight loss. If you have a group that you're giving weight loss supplements to, and having them exercise an additional 30 minutes per day. Are they losing weight because they're exercising or are they losing weight because of the supplement? So you've got a confounding variable because you can't identify exactly what the weight loss is coming from. So just being able to make sure that you can uh, measure that one variable specifically. So that would be what confounding variables is. Um, randomization is completely randomizing group selections to ensure that each group is represented in the control and treatment group. So just get back to weight loss. If our um, control group is going to be this, so the people not receiving treatment is going to be um, people who are overweight and not doing anything, and then you have people in the treatment group who are super into working out and taking the supplements, it's going to look like the supplement's working, but the people are super workout people, so it, it might not represent it. You would want to have an equal amount of the workout people in the control group and the treatment group. So you want to randomize the people, not just group everyone together and stick them in one group. And then replication. Get a good enough sample so the results can be replicated. If you think about um, flu vaccines, would you want to take a flu vaccine that had only been tested um, with 100 people? Or would you want to have a flu vaccine that had been tested with 100,000 people? So you want to make sure that it's got adequate testing. 
All right. A company identifies 240 adult smokers who are heavy smokers. The subjects are randomly assigned to a treatment group or in a control group. Each DVD is also given a, or each subject is also given a DVD featuring the dangers of smoking. After four months, most of the subjects in the treatment group have quit smoking. Is there any problem in this, and what would you recommend to improve it? So I'm going to pause it for a second and think about it. Or actually, this is a point where you should be pausing the video and thinking about it um, and coming up with your conclusion before you continue on. Okay, so hopefully you notice that there is a problem with this. Um, each subject is given a DVD, um, both in the control group and outside the control group. So we don't know if the DVD had any um, influence on them quitting smoking or not. So the treatment group was getting a treatment, but each subject is also given a DVD, so there's a little bit of confounding variables. So it's hard to determine if the DVD did the work or if the drug in the treatment group did the work. So you'd have to kind of isolate your variables in a better manner. This is a little repetitive. When data is to be collected from each member of the population, it's known as a census survey. Okay, everybody's being asked. But when data is being collected only from some members, then it's going to be a sample. And that's known as a sample survey. So that's just bringing back some stuff. So there's sampling techniques. Um, random sampling, you have simple random sampling, and you have stratified random sampling. Random sampling is when everyone has equal chance of being selected. Everybody has an equal chance of being selected. Um, it's not convenient to do random sampling, and a lot of people think of random as something that's, well, it's random, it's easy, but it's not. Because what we want to do is make sure everyone has an equal chance. So random sampling could be where everyone's given a number, and then I draw numbers out of the hat and ask those people that I drew numbers out of a hat for. Or it could be based on student IDs, so everybody in the school has an equal chance of having their number picked. Um, I could put all your names in a hat, and you'd all have an equal chance of being selected. So that's what we consider with random sampling. The next one's cluster sampling. Um, a good example of this is a zip code, and what that means is I have the state of Massachusetts. Everybody's associated with a zip code. I'll pick one zip code and ask everybody in that zip code the question for my survey. So that's a cluster, a small group. Um, I could do to represent Westfield, and I could put you all according to your dorms and just ask one dorm. Um, you, there could be some potential problems for our traveling people, but maybe the question would be geared toward residents. Uh, so it's putting, it's picking one group out of a total group. The next one would be systematic sampling, and that's asking, uh, setting up a system. Um, and I'm just going to put every third as an example. I could stand outside the cafeteria and ask every third person what their favorite food is in the cafeteria. So there's a clear system. I'm going to ask the third person. I could go through um, my Facebook list and ask every third friend that's, if it's in alphabetical order, a certain question. So it's a specific system that we're doing. And the last one is convenience sampling. Um, if I were to can ask you guys a question that I was trying to gather data for in class um, when I see you next, it's convenient for me just to ask you guys. If you guys went back to your dorm and asked the people in your dorm room um, a question, it's convenient for you to ask them, okay? Here's the big stressor, big, big, big stressor. Convenience sampling and random sampling are not the same thing. Convenience is easy. It's convenient. Random is not, okay? Random is everybody has an equal chance. People confuse these two all the time, so um, really, really, really don't fall for that trick or the misconception. Um, random is not easy. Methods of random sampling is a random numbers table, which I can show you in class. Um, there's a function on your TAI 84, which it generates one. There's applications where you put names in and it'll generate a name for you. Like I said, um, pick out of a hat, out of hat, uh, oops, hat, 
oh geez Louise, pick out of a hat. Um, I can also do by pick student IDs, pick by student IDs. There's so many things, but everybody gets an equal chance a chance of being asked. Okay. Oh, here's the random number table. So um, if we had student IDs, okay, and let's say there are five numbers, I would pick. I'm going to go with third row, um, second column. So third row, second column. I'd go to the one, two, third row, second column, and I'd start here. So this would be my first number, that would be my second number. Some people go so far as to say, um, the, the let's go with the fourth position. So if I were to do that, I'd say, well, my third row, one, two, three, my second column, so here in the fourth position, it means that I would start here. So the first number would be four, six, nine, seven, six. So it's completely random because you're picking this and then going into the table to find where you start from. In random sampling, to make sure that you are um, doing randomization so that everybody is accounted for, you can break them into groups. Okay, So I'll have my Caucasians in one group, my African Americans in another, and my Hispanic Americans in another. And then within them, I'm going to random sample random sample, random sample. So maybe I pick, um, I'm stuck on the number three for some reason, but um, three um, from this group, three from this group, and three from this group to make sure the entire demographic is represented. This is stratified sampling and it's a method of random sampling. Random, that's an O, random sampling. Simple random sampling means you're not trying to get into each of the groups. Um, but stratified sampling is making sure that you have every group represented. Cluster sampling, um, remember we're having our groups. So with cluster sampling, I've got the people on 1st Ave, the people on 2nd Ave, and the people on 3rd Ave. So I've broken them into streets. And I'm just going to go ask everybody on 3rd Ave what their favorite day of the week is. And that'll um, be my sample that I'm going to use to make my inferences upon. Systematic sampling is I'm coming up with a number of, you know, what number person I'm going to ask. So if I'm looking at it, I'm doing, um, I'm asking the first one, I'm asking the first one. I'm not asking the second one, I'm skipping the third. I'm asking the fourth, so it looks like here we're doing every fourth one. Whenever the green ones are, we're going to ask that person. And the other people, we just politely let go by. Um, convenient sampling, this is easy. I am the researcher. I stand here and I ask the people who are next to me. Okay, But obviously, um, as you look through it, you're seeing all these purple individuals. Um, maybe they're uh, representing an age group. And we're not getting that age group in our sampling because we're restricting ourselves to just what's around us. So um, with convenient sampling, you just have to be mindful that you don't miss out on different demographics. Okay, so this was our uh, 1.3 lesson, and we will review more in class. Have a great day.